That's like a conundrum. It's a contradiction in terms, living stone. But uh, stone was the common building material in the Middle East. If you built a house, you built it out of stone. And a house is something that is often used in scripture as a metaphor, and even household is spoken of as a house. But, but the temple of God was a house. And so we have this whole play on these words between the, a house and between the temple of God and, and it being a type of the church of Jesus Christ, the old temple, and a natural versus a spiritual house. And so houses are built out of stone. So this is the metaphor that is being used here. And um, when we think about characteristics of stone, they are things like durability. No doubt there are still stones that were put in place when Jesus was on the earth that are still there, you know. And so when we think about Jesus and how he, why he would be called a stone, that might be one reason that Durable, that he's always the same. He's always there. And, and uh, yesterday, today, and forever, he never changes. He, uh, durability, stability, or strength. Immovable, inflexible. Peter, the writer, his name means a stone. His name is Petra. And um, Jesus gave him that name. He was Simon, the son of Jonah. But one day when Jesus was asking, who do men say that I am? Peter made this wonderful confession of Christ. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, said, uh, your name is Cephas or Peter. It's rock. And he said, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the rock that he was speaking of was Peter's confession that Jesus was the Christ. That's the rock upon which the church is built. And that's what our text is about today. Peter himself reiterating again that Jesus is the chief cornerstone and proving it from Old Testament scriptures. This is one of the things that blesses my faith so much is to see the continuity between the Old and New Testament and how the new fulfills the old. It's not something that's just new sort of pulled out of the sky, but it's solidly built on the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and many of the promises that, um, that are in the Old Covenant. When we think about the temple that Jesus is building, the house that he is building, of which he himself is the uh, there are so many scriptures that come to mind, like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says, you are God's building. In verse 11, he says, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And let every man be careful how he builds on it, whether he builds out of wood, hay, or stubble, or precious stones and gold and silver. The day will declare it because every man's work will be tested by fire, and it and his work will be proven whether it's really supernatural or whether it's just natural, you know. And um, the testing of time will prove it. But, uh, but this temple that God is building, in contrast to the Jewish temple, which was a natural, national temple, that temple, not one stone is left on the other. Jesus prophesied that. But the temple that Jesus is building is an eternal temple. It will last forever and ever. It's the in heaven. But it's a spiritual temple. And many times I think people confuse the prophecies of the two. But what is there about Jesus that's like a rock? Uh, there are many Old Testament prophecies that point to him and call him the rock. One of the first ones that I was able to find was um, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was blessing his children. And he blessed Joseph, and this is part of what he said to him. He said, the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. Speaking of what happened to Joseph in his life. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. 
From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That's one of the first prophecies that I could find Jesus being called a stone. But he's talking about the God of hosts, the mighty God of Israel, and that from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. <clears throat> Another prophecy is Isaiah, Isaiah 28, 16, which is quoted in this passage. It says, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a tried stone. This would be like a proven stone, a stone that's been tested and proven and tried. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. I don't know if it was David, but in the Psalms, Psalm 118, 22, it says this, which is also quoted here. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So our scripture today was a classic illustration of that. When Stephen was preaching Jesus, they cast him aside. It was like they wanted nothing to do with it. They stoned him to death. They stoned the messenger. And um, so they cast aside this precious cornerstone and even though God set it as the sure foundation, <clears throat> they cast it aside as unfitting. Isaiah 8.14, the Lord of hosts says he will be as a God of the armies. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was one of my notes. The Lord of hosts means God of the armies. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. So here you have this amazing contrast in the Old Testament already. How is a person supposed to understand this? He came into the world and fulfilled all these prophecies. How are they supposed to recognize him? Because you have all these conflicting kinds of things. On the one hand, he's the chief cornerstone. He's the most important aspect of the building. And you and I are building a life. And if Jesus is the cornerstone of our life, he occupies the most strategic, important aspect of our life. To us, he is absolutely the most strategic, important aspect of our life. He's the cornerstone of our lives. He is also building a church, and he is the cornerstone of the church as well. But to others, he is a stone of stumbling. They fall over him. They stumble over him and fall down because of him. A rock of offense to both the house of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdom. So what is there about Jesus that's like a rock? He is durable, stable, strong, immobile, inflexible, unchanging, abiding, secure. These really speak of the spiritual realities that we enjoy. Things like his resurrection. The fact that he is alive today. He will never change. He's always present. His endless life. His timeless sacrifice and priesthood. Hebrews tells us he ever lives to make intercession for us. So it's timeless. Today, it's just as effective as it was 2,000 years ago when he died. It will never change. It will be that way for eternity. He will stand as our sacrifice and as our, our acceptance is in him. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's always with us and in us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is always there. A one generation follows another, but he remains constant. Kingdoms come and go. Political systems come, but Jesus is the constant. He is always there. <clears throat> a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You know, um, God once said that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high, so much higher are my thoughts than your thoughts. And when we look at our needs, just as a human being, and no doubt it was true for the Jews as well, uh, we see one set of needs, and God might see an entirely different set of needs. Because he thinks different. He sees from the perspective of eternity. He sees from the perspective of knowing the end from the beginning and knowing everything about us. And so um, the way he looks at it is different than the way that we look at it. But um, 
The Jews in their day saw the need for national deliverance from natural enemies. And that's what they were primarily looking for when Jesus came into the world. National deliverance from natural enemies. And looking back, we know that what God did was an international deliverance from supernatural enemies. It was way, way bigger. And from God's perspective, far, far more important and far more far-reaching. We have a... um, we have a prime example. The other couple Sundays ago, we had a missionary here from Nigeria. And it happened, of course, we know about the girls that were abducted and about Boko Haram. I'd never heard of them before. And, and now they're just in the news all the time, you know, and it's, it's this huge deal. You know, it's this terrorist organization. Now they're saying last night in the news that, um, I, online anyway, that um, they're not just in Nigeria. Now they're spreading to all other countries, and it's this growing threat that everybody is concerned about. Well, what is the answer? You know, the natural answer is to send army rangers, drones, helicopters, an army. The spiritual answer is to send a missionary. Which one do you have the most faith in? That's what God did. God sent Jesus. He sent a savior. He sent a message. He actually it came himself. It's basically what he did. But, but to change men's hearts, to change men's minds, to bring a new example, a way of life, a way of life that is life-changing, Jesus said that if we hear and do what he teaches, it's like building our life on a solid rock. If we hear and do not, we're just building our life on the sand. So that's what people need. They need that message, and they need the power to live it, the power to carry it out. They need a life that's transformed from the inside and is lived from the inside out, and that's what God offers us in Christ. It is more powerful than all the armies of the world. You know, I often think about the fact that um, just what this scripture reminds us of, that we, when we think about us as a people, we're not always Christian. And it says we were, in one place Paul says, we were without God and without hope in the world. But why are we Christian? Why is the West Christianized? It's because at some point there were missionaries that wild places where they risked their lives in order to do it. It's like one missionary said, uh, somebody said that you're going to die if you go there. And it was a lady and she said, well, I died before I left, you know. And like the uh, missionary said to me last week or a couple weeks ago when he was here, we were talking about the danger. He said every day when he goes out, he tells his wife goodbye and tells her that if I don't come back today, we will meet again some someday. And, you know, I was sort of taken aback by that. And, and then he just said very simply, he said, we all have to die sometime. And, you know, we just die in different ways. And so, um, so someone did that for us. Someone risked their lives to take the gospel to the countries that we now call the West. And um, there are some pretty wild stories about that, about people who went out and, and like um, St. Patrick, of course, is one of them, but, um, but many others like him, many that we don't even know their names. And we, our forefathers heard the news and repented and, and received Christ. On the one hand, there is deliverance for time. If we send an army and take care of the problem, maybe. But um, on the other hand, it's deliverance for eternity. One is for time, the other one is for eternity. Uh, One has an enduring help, a redeemer, a savior, a deliverer. One offers ultimate eternal salvation. You know, uh, Stephen was stoned, but he was saved. Isn't that amazing? And so it is with today as well. Many of those people who are being persecuted and dying in Nigeria, 
It's going to result, I can tell you, in a tremendous revival over there. It's going to happen. The blood of the martyrs is seed, Tertullian said, you know, 1,500, almost 2,000 years ago. And it's still true today. China. Today, there are more people coming to Christ in China than any other place in the world. And I forget how many it is every day, but it's an absolutely astounding number. But it's because of the price that had been, has been paid by those who gave their lives to take the gospel there. <clears throat> we, too, can choose to set Jesus aside as a common stone. You know, our scripture says that uh, he has chosen, that he is precious, he is the chief cornerstone. But the Israelites set him aside as just a common stone, one among many. But really, Jesus doesn't give us any kind of choice like that. Um, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We read that today. And no man comes to the Father except by me. So really, the choice that we have is either to believe or choose to reject that. Um, it was not me who chose Christ to be this world's rock. You know, it's not me that sort of decided to put up Jesus as the one, as the, as the answer to the world's problems. But rather, it was the mighty God of hosts one time when um, some of the Jews were asking Jesus, they said, uh, what must we do to work the works of God? He said, believe on him whom he has sent. It was God who sent him. And I'm a Christian because I believe that Jesus is that rock. That he is the way. And in fact, in the early church, that's what they called them. They said, the people of the way, it says in the book of Acts. Jesus himself said that whoever falls on this rock will be broken. Um, basically, what happens in, if we can, um, when a person comes to Christ, is that he is broken. That self, that self centeredness, the selfishness, the thing that makes us want to be the center of the universe and make life all about me, and make the whole storyline of everything that's happening around me all about me, is broken. And Jesus becomes the center instead of that. And it actually frees us. You know, that, uh, that kind of selfishness, if you want to really see it, take into its ultimate, um, into its ultimate context. Uh, go to an insane asylum. And you'll see that many of them uh, life is all about them. About it's just it's like a vortex. It sucks you down into it if you let it. It's so important, and it's so important for young people, but for all of us, that our focus is out of ourselves. You know that we are we are looking up to God. We are looking at people. We are feeling what they feel. We're not just trapped in our own feelings and our own emotions, our own thoughts about ourselves. Because that's like a vortex that'll just suck us down and suck us in. But um, I believe that Jesus is that is that central figure. That he is the Christ, the son of the living God. So whoever falls on this rock will be broken. And in that breaking we will be shaped for the eternal temple, the new Jerusalem. Where the walls are built out of precious stones. And we are those stones. We too, like the scripture says today, are living. We have those same qualities of uh, being tried and proven and precious in the sight of God. And, um, but we are alive. And it's, it's, it's happening in the course of our life. It's happening in the course of every day. You know, when we're not thinking about it, our character is being shaped and formed and changed. And, and um, it's not like we don't have anything to do with it. But... But it's happening oftentimes when we don't think about it. So whoever falls on this rock will be broken. And he'll be uh, fitted as a stone in the temple of God. Did you know that um, on the temple site, when they were building Solomon's temple, there wasn't the sound of a hammer? Because the stones were all quarried 
a ways off, and they were quarried for the spot that they were going to go, and it was all done out there. When they came in, they just fitted them in. They just fit. And that's how it is for us. We're being fitted every day. And we don't know, we don't understand what's going on. We don't know why we go through the precise things that we do. Or why we have to learn things. Or why we have to suffer things. Or whatever it is. I know that, um, that sometimes, even in this life, we, we do get a little bit more understanding about why we go through what we do. But I know over the years I would often say to the Lord, why me? You know, why is it important that I learn this? You know, and, um, but God is shaping us for something that's great. Whoever falls on this rock will be broken, but on whomever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's Jesus that said that. So now we have the privilege or we have the opportunity or we have the ability to just sort of cast him aside as a common stone. But it won't always be that way. One day there's a day of reckoning. So um, that grind him to powder I think speaks of total absolute eternal destruction in hell with the devil and his angels. So we don't have a lot of options. But we have a clear choice. Either believe the message of God, or we don't. We either accept or begin to sift and sort and decide for ourselves. And when we go down that slope, when we start down that way, it's a slippery slope that has no bottom. There's no place to stop because it's all subjective. It all has to do with what we think, our little finite minds, and, um, and what we choose to believe. So we don't have a lot of options, but we do have a clear choice. We either set the rock aside to fall upon us later, or we break our pride and set the rock in the most important strategic site in this life that we are building, right in the center of our heart. You know, Put our faith in him. Trust him. Trust him with our life. Trust him with salvation but trust him with everything. And we can expect that that decision will be severely tested and tried. And ultimately, we will discover that it rests upon the faithfulness of God in whom we have put our faith, rather than just on ourselves. God is faithful. He is the Alpha and the Omega. What he starts, he will finish. And when we put our trust in him, we will and that's what our text says today. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Anyone who puts his tr their trust in him will not be put to shame. But um, we have seen many, we have many examples of those who have rejected him and of the outcome of that as well. So thank you again for um, your kind attention and thank you for the fellowship that we can have as we together give him that strategic place in our life. Let's stand together for uh, prayer. <clears throat> <clears throat> Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is life. Thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, today we put our faith in you as you reveal your word to our hearts. God, I pray that this Bible would not just be something written with pen and ink, but that it would be engraved upon our hearts by your spirit. That you would grant us, Lord, to hear it with hearts, to see it with the eyes of our hearts, and, um, and be blessed and grow through it. But thank you, Lord, for sharing it with us. In Jesus' name, amen.